Welcome to the Paradox of Life, the podcast where we ask the questions no one dares to ask. But everyone wants to know. We will open Pandora's box to show you a world where anything is possible. What you do with it is a choice we leave to you. We are your hosts, Monique and Colin. Welcome to the Paradox of Life. Today we're talking about non-duality. Duality and duality, non-duality. It's a it's a concept that I've really struggled to get my head around. And I I've I've read about this, I've I've heard lots about this, I've explored lots in these areas, and yet it's still something that confounds me a little. So before we dive in, Monique, just explain to a a, a novice like me the difference between what we understand as duality and non-duality, and then we can begin and we can unpick. Okay. Uh, disclaimer, I'm not an expert on this, but I'm I'm going to explain it in how I understand these concepts. So duality for me means basically living in experiencing the coin and the two sides. So basically you experience life in the different forms and you have to experience both experiences in order to understand the one or the other. Meaning there is no day without the night. There is no happiness without sadness. There is no uh, good without evil and so on. So basically in order to experience anything, you need to know both sides of the coin. And so this is basically duality. And most, I would say most spiritual people believe that Basically, we live in a life of duality because uh, we need to understand the full spectrum of the frequencies. Therefore, we need to understand both sides of the coin. And you cannot have an experience of, for example, pure joy if you don't have had an experience of, uh, will be the opposite, um, frustration maybe or disappointment or... Uh, basically the opposite side of what joy would be. Now, non-duality. So the concept of non-duality, as I understand it, is the concept that we are all one. And that, so basically everything in the universe is one and also none. So meaning we're all interconnected in our minds, in our thinking, in, in our frequency, in the vibration with the planet, with the elements, with the animals, with the nature, everything. And also in between us as a society, with, uh, which makes sense because of all of our thoughts and whatever, right? We have very similar thoughts, um, no matter where we come from and cultures and backgrounds and whatever. And so um, it also means that, for example, the night and the day, would be the same experience but in a kind of just a different form if that makes sense so happiness is basically the same experience than sadness just expressed in a different form so that's how i understand non-duality i hope this was understandable very understandable and very helpful. Thank you for sharing. Okay, so if anyone else has a different understanding or maybe um, a different way how they use these concepts, maybe they want to just share it in the comments below. Okay, so I actually, um, I don't know if you've seen when I pulled the cards, the first one, just a stack of cards throughout. <laughs> it was really interesting because they all fit very well into both of these concepts, but I got actually two of them because um, I reshuffled. Uh, let's see if the camera picks it up. Okay, so we've got the Fool and we've got the Ace of Wands. And for me, they're perfectly for both of these. So I would say duality is the fool and non-duality is the ace of wands. So I'm gonna start with the fool, the duality. So the fool, as you can see here in the traditional tarot, so in, in this tarot, it's a dog who jumps off a cliff and leaves a red feather behind. 
And off the cliff, there is like a little field with like flowers and some leaves. And the dog leaps off this cliff and basically just jumps into the unknown. Now with duality, this is often the uh, thing that people are so afraid of because even though there's kind of like two sides of the coin and there's like a fairly um, black and white understanding of this concept where it gets really interesting and where most people are um, afraid to live in duality is the in-between. And the in-between is the uncertainty that non-dual uh, the duality brings with um, as an experience, basically. And I think that's where the fool, which is in traditional tarot, the beginning of the journey of like basically of that fool, which is the in the traditional tarot, the person that starts the journey through the whole um tarot arcana basically and for me it, like it just feels like living in duality oftentimes means we have to jump off the cliff we just have to in order to experience the thing that we want to experience we have to take the leap of faith and and risk to experience the opposite so if we want to experience a life uh, full of joy, we need to risk to be disappointed and to um, to be frustrated and to, you know, experience all of the other things too in order to get to where we want to go. And that means we need to jump off the cliff because nothing in the world of duality is really certain, isn't it? Um, because it's like really throwing a coin sometimes, right? You, you don't know if we end up head or tail and with the ace of wands which is a really funny one so this looks like there is a path into I would say it's like the deserts but it's with mountains it, they look pretty fiery there's mm -hmm. a castle way in the back but this is a lizard or a gecko paw do you say a paw for geckos I don't know <laughs> a gecko I don't know. foot <laughs> and it, oh, it, claw, it, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> a, a, a gecko foot, I don't even know. Pot foot, <laughs> uh, I have to Google that. And it it grabs a branch of a uh, bush or a tree and basically a little wand. And like the ace of wands traditionally is basically a it's like a kind of a spiritual awakening it can be the beginning of a new uh and what's the word that wants to come through like a new era of like an, an opening of your mind you like a what's the word a revelation mm. <laughs> and an upgrade basically to your own mindset and um the aces is always a start it's it's like something new um it could be new opportunities or new ways to go and with this path here in the back to me it looks like that it it kind of feels like um that we are ready to grasp basically a new way of living or a new way of thinking or a new way of experiencing the world. And um, that for me describes somewhat non-duality because it really is walking the path without knowing what you're doing really, because none of us know what we are doing. And we all kind of just trying to figure it out. But um, it is a consistent revelation and awakening to new ways of being. And that's like in the end, we hopefully get to the castle basically here. And um, 
we can only go as far as the most unawakened, like the, the least unawakened people in the world, if that makes sense. So because we are all one, the collective has to help wake people up. And I don't mean that in this like new age, woke kind of, I mean, people become more conscious of themselves and of their lives and of their choices and the opportunities around them and how they live and what they can change in their lives. If a lot of people stay unconscious in their living and unintentional, then we cannot upgrade society as a whole. And so we're basically only as strong as the weakest and least um, awoken people in our society. And that's what I feel like the Ace of Wands kind of describes for the non-duality. Beautiful. I love how you share that. So much came up when you were sharing the idea of grasping, Go ahead. <laughs> the idea of grasping on the, in the Ace of Wands there reminds me of the idea of attachment and clinging and this beautiful pathway is ahead of you with a castle and mountains and glorious awakening. And yet we still, we still grasp and we cling. And sometimes that can hinder us on that path. Mm. And so it was just, yeah, it was be a beautiful description. Thanks for that, Monique. Both of those cards just bring up so much, don't they, about, about this whole thing. And what you were describing when you were talking about non-duality to me is it's the it's the journey of awakening that 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 we go through and the elevation of conscious awareness throughout the entire of of creation this sense of awareness that you are in there and that you are part of something that is bigger than you like i've been doing the gateway experience you know we've talked about that previously the cia mm. gateway experience meditations and one of the affirmations that you do as part of those meditations is to say, I am more than my physical body. And this appreciation and understanding that we are not just this isolated thing trapped inside of this, this um, biological spacesuit, as Sherman Durek describes it, right? Um, we are more than that. And the Ace of Wands card just speaks to that perpetual journey that we're all on walking down that path to the castle it's lovely so how do you feel in your life about like living in a non-dual world but experiencing life in duality one of the biggest things on my journey was the understanding reading the Kabbalion, right for starters understanding the true nature of this existence true as in universal truth described by Buddhists, by Hindus, by lots of established, lots of mainstream religions across the world. There's a beautiful saying of when you know the, tr the way broadly, you begin to see it in all things. And for mm. me, this exploration has helped me to see the reality of this non-dual existence through the lens of Christianity, of judaism of zen of buddhism and all of these different traditions and mysticism and all of these different things seeing what i see as perceive as the way and that shift in thinking that opening up of the pathway for me in my journey monique came from reading the kabbalion and appreciating that everything is degrees of scale so the universal law of polarity that there is not dark and night like light and dark, two sides of the coin, like you describe, there are just different degrees of scale. So hot and cold don't exist. There are just t degrees along that pathway from hot to cold. It's all relative. It's all perspective. So hot to me might be cold to you, right? Uh, mm. Whatever, however we kind of play with this, the idea that, oh, wow. So, so my, my thinking, my interpretation is all relative everything is relative to the way that i see and interpret the world and just appreciating that there is so much more there are degrees of scale in all things really just opened my eyes and my mind up to this sense of 
things being much bigger and more than we can ever conceive inside of this little body that we're in, having this little experience that we're having, you know? Mm. How about you? How about you? Um, I think where I can see it the most is when I when I traveled full time. Um, I used to travel solo full time, right? Since I was nineteen years old, I would live in different countries, and then later on, when I was I think twenty six, I left my home country and I would travel to like 45 plus countries for seven years full time. And I think what was surprising to me is how vastly different the people in the different countries seemed and their culture, yet they had so many similar fears and thoughts. And it was, it was almost like as if we all had this big pot of <laughs> of like thoughts in the middle of the universe and we can all just pick and choose which ones we can think but is i don't think people are aware of how much alike people think and what I mean is not like that they think that they believe the same thing. That's different. So it's not like, for example, if you come to Asia, Southeast Asia particularly, um, they love white skin. They just love it so much that you can barely find a beauty product that is without skin whitener. Like any shower gel, soaps, creams, lotions, anything is with a uh, bleach um to widen your skin and <laughs> and they laugh people with white skin so they want to be all white and when you go to western countries in europe you know especially in the north there's not a lot of sun so what do people do they run into solariums in order to get a little bit more tanned and get more vitamin d because they actually love tan skin which doesn't mean they laugh like or people of color they just love tan and skin which is completely weird but let's not talk about this now but what I mean with this is the underlying thought is I don't like how I look like I like how the others look like so even though the belief is totally different because one believes tan skin is more beautiful and the other believes white skin is more beautiful but the underlying thought is that my skin is not beautiful. <laughs> and you can go in any country in the world is basically the majority of people think the same thing. They do something to enhance their visual uh, appearance, right? And so that's just a really basic example. And we all know that it also has to do with the media and how um, beauty is portrayed in the media and all the advertisements and marketing and yada, yada, yada. But um, just to say that it just, <laughs> just because, for example, white skin has been made so beautiful doesn't mean people in Germany think white skin looks really great. They still want to be more tanned. You know what I mean? And it's so weird because don't you see how people everywhere else in the world want to look like you and yet you want to look like everyone else in the world but you don't like them as a people so anyways again but I feel that comes back to the uh, non-duality because why else would we all have very similar thoughts they express themselves differently but if we weren't connected and if we didn't have like if we didn't have those frequency fields and and depending on which frequency field or vibration you are on, basically, you connect to this field. And if basically your vibration is I'm not good enough, your thoughts are going to be around whatever is not good enough on you, right? But if you feel love, then you will connect with the thoughts that people have all around love. And so 
when I found out about this and I thought like traveling around the world and I saw how everyone is so similar in what they think, it just expresses differently. I was like, something else is going on here. Like it, it's almost as if we were connecting to the same, uh, to the same storage, to the same, uh, what's it called on the computer? Yeah, like oh. mem memory bank or hard drive yeah. or something. Yeah, 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 the same yeah. hard drive. And um, that it was a little creepy at the beginning. But then on the other hand, it made me think like, maybe that's a good thing. Because what if we also had the power to change what's on the hard drive? Mm -hmm. There's also an, an element in all of this of that sense of cultural context so when i used to i used to lecture in marketing communications and we one of the things that i used to teach was international marketing communications marketing across borders so taking a a brand that we know in the west and then how you go about communicating the values and what that brand's all about in different in different cultures right and one of the things that's came up in in my understanding and studies in that area was the idea of cultural context so the beauty products with bleach to whiten the skin in asia versus the desire to go to sunbeds and get a tan and have bronzed skin in the west right it's like this this weird polarity in thinking and yet the the underlying drive is is the same the drive to to be better to be what we perceive to be better from where we are right now, like that state change from where I am to where I want to be. That's universal, mm -hmm. whether we go east to west. The only difference is the context. This I love how Michael Singer calls it the scenery of life, like the, mm. the scenery around us that we exist in. Because, you know, you are sat in that chair that you're sat in right now, in that place, on that place on the planet. I'm on a different physical place in the planet. And yet there is this beautiful, invisible, if we can perceive it, this invisible energy and force that sits inside and permeates around and through and over and under all things and creates this bond, this connection that we can't see. We stay stuck in what we can see without necessarily appreciating that which we can't. And I think that's mm. what you what you allude to, Monique, when you share about the consciousness and how we are as strong as the the least awake, least conscious aware being on the planet. And I think that's that's so true. You have to become aware and then you have to walk that pathway on the card, don't you? In order to continually evolve and change your thinking and the way that you view these things. How did you become aware first? Can you remember how you kind of... Yeah started questioning I, I remember the journey for me the journey started when i was 39 so i'm 49 right now mm -hmm. for me it started when i was 39 and i had one, one guy on my journey when i was building a business i built a business to multiple millions in revenue and focused on money right success money all of those machismo things right and um one of the guys who i didn't realize but was a mentor of mine said that colin life is not a rehearsal. And that stuck with me at that time. I didn't wake up, stayed focused on money. Then in 2013, my business went bust and I lost everything that I owned in the world materially, physically. And in the aftermath of that failure, I began to explore who am I? Like, why am I mm. here? Like I, I thought I was going to be this big multimillionaire business on, owner entrepreneur running this, you know, big venture and taking over the world and all of this. And, you know, as we all as a kid, I'm going to be famous. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. I'm going to be all of these things. Right. Uh, I wanted to be the fall guy. You know that uh, there's a movie just come out about the fall guy, like the, the Lee Majors or the million dollar, six million dollar man. You know, I like I wanted to be a hero. And then that business went bust. And I realized, shit, man, I'm 39. I'm the world's biggest failure. I've just lost everything I own in the world. And then I began a journey of discovery and mm. somebody recommended a, um, some books to me, recommended I started listening to Alan Watts, the 
mm. modern day philosopher. And it began there. It just began with a journey of exploration from there, Monique, for me. How about you? Mm -hmm. Um, I know a lot of people don't believe that, but it's that's on them. Um, I think it began really, really early for me uh, when I was a child, uh, because I was born with these um, life-threatening physical issues. So the time I first can remember, I think it was around, well, the first time <laughs> I must have been around, um, I think I was nine, honestly, when the first time I was diagnosed with one of my neurological um, diseases. And the doctor told me that I would have this forever and it would only get worse and I would have to take pills for the rest of my life. And it's something that will never go away. My mom broke down in the in the doctor's office and I said to him, how do you know? Like, <laughs> of course I can heal that. And I was nine and I I knew because my whole life I was born with like, you know, all of these things. And um, I just never, <laughs> I don't know where this comes from, but I'm so glad I have it. I just never believed doctors. Like it, it was, it was such a weird thing to me that they would, look at me and tell me you have this and it will never go away when they didn't know me. And it was more like about, you don't know me. How do you know I can't get out of this basically, right? So it was more like, a, it almost felt like a personal attack. Like, how do you, I can't do this. Like, watch me kind of thing. So when I was 13, uh, I had, uh, man, <laughs> not a good time 13 to 15 basically I went through a really rough time I had to stop dancing ballet I had knees injuries so badly I couldn't walk I I crawled through school on all of four and <laughs> don't even don't even get me started on the bullying that I went through because I couldn't walk upstairs without using my hands and I had to throw my backpack upstairs like it was horrendous and the physiotherapist the first one um fucked my knees up because he did the wrong exercises and everything so it got even worse and so I was like okay if I go to an expert apparently and they just make everything worse and I have all of this knowledge from dancing ballet for over 11 years why don't I just do it myself and so there was no internet yet I mean the internet was just just gotten into the houses of East Germany or just post East Germany but it took like you know 15 minutes to connect with this weird like screeching sound and so <laughs> I went to the library and I got a stack of books about like um physiotherapy and healing and whatnot and so basically I was like at this point I was 14 15 14 years old and I healed my knees myself by trial and error and finding out and it made it clicked in my head that I know everyone is putting me down for questioning and I'm always being silenced and people are really angry that I ask so many questions but I'm right to asking them so because I was always this kid I would always ask why is that why is that why are you doing this this way why can't we do it that way why does it have to be this way? you know what I mean like I would question everything and everyone <laughs> And I often would just do it my way. And I was in trouble all the fucking time. But from that point on, I promised myself, even if I forgot it along the way sometimes, or if people kind of just beat it out of me <laughs> in one or the other way, I basically questioned everything that I was told. And, um, you know, I died of a cardiac arrest when I was 19. And that was kind of the big awakening for me it was like because I went to this other dimension and even though I didn't cross with Rhi at this time but I knew that there was so much more out there and that I didn't even know what like I knew that I didn't know enough for what this life is what it's all about and I was really keen to find out and that's when I started traveling 
and basically leaving Germany and like leaving my hometown. And like I moved out when I was 17 from my parents' house. But when I was 19, I left my hometown, my home country, everything. And I was like, okay, this is it. I just have to, I just have to find out what this is. And so <clears throat> I would say the most pivotal moment was around like between 13 and 15, because I also started to do a lot of mindset work not knowing that it was called mindset or anything it like self-development was at this time not even a thing like it was the early 2000s right <laughs> and so no one was talking about mindset no one was but I was I'm doing this work ever since and um I went through a lot of different phases you know the like the toxic positivity this the spiritual like all of them and I left them all behind again to find my own way because again I'm questioning everything I question everything <laughs> and so well here I am and um yeah I thank you I, for sharing I I think questioning everything is really critical don't you because that's the hmm. precursor to all of this I think that's one of the things that's driven me all through my life is that I do pe I do people's heads in because I'm like, why? Like, why? Like, why? Tell me why. You know, like one of those pesky kids that pulls tell on the parents' why? coat thing. Like, tell me why? Why? Why is that? Why is that? Just like a natural curiosity. And I remember reading that curiosity is the precursor to creative energy, hmm. like to creativity. And I think if we can all have that natural curiosity, it's the reason we created this podcast, Monique. It was to ask the hmm. questions that, we don't normally ask, like, is there more to this? Like we live in our body, part of the awakening path. I lived in my body, satisfying, you know, the needs of the physical uh, wealth, well-being, well-being from a physical perspective, all of those things without even realizing that there's more. There's so much more to this existence than what we see with our eyes and what we can touch with our hands. And I think if we only begin to inquire and ask that why question that's the thing that's the thing that drive drove you after those experiences to explore right mm. you know it's interesting because if you ask me if I'm a curious person I would say no <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know why it's I just kind of don't resonate with this um with the meaning of the word really because I'm not I'm not naturally curious about everything I guess if if someone comes along I don't want to know everything about everyone um I can't you know how a small talk is the worst thing so please don't tell me anything about your kids and the weather and your cats <laughs> dogs okay but and snakes also and bears I want to know about your bear in the backyard but I couldn't I couldn't care less and I know this is really harsh but I really couldn't care less about your family stories like not not how you grew up that's different but I mean the trauma that's going on right now I don't care for your trauma I don't care for um what trouble you had with Uncle Mick and Auntie Emma and why they're mad at you I really don't care I like it's just it it's I I wouldn't even remember their names, even if you said them three times to me. And so I don't think of myself as curious, but what I think of myself is as a truth seeker. And I want to find the truth in everything. And I don't care about Uncle Emma's... Uncle Emma. <laughs> uh, see, I <laughs> couldn't even remember the... <laughs> about your uncles and aunties truth about the dilemma and and trauma they have in family. I don't care about that I care about the deep modern day philosophy philosophy truth the psychology and human potential the lifestyles that we want to create for ourselves in order to live out our highest potential how we can get into touch with our highest self and what it would do instead of me being here and you know what I mean it's like like, I want to go to the deepest well that I can find. And I don't care <laughs> mm. 
what's on the surface, to be honest. And the surface for me is all of the trauma and all of the distractions. So I don't care for these distractions. And I think a lot of people think about curiosity in that way. They think curiosity means you need to be interested in all of those surface le level things too, because that's how they perceive it. They only are interested in surface level because they can't, they, they don't know how to go deep or they don't dare how to go deep because they are afraid of meeting something there. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm the person who runs head into conflict all the fucking time not necessarily on purpose but if i have to i'm creating the conflict only like i'm starting the fire only though because i have troubles to you know how when the fire is not burning but it's climbing under the surface i can't deal with that because you can't see it you can smell it but you can't see it but if you step on it you just burn your whole feet open I'm not going to step on your coals that glim out there. You can't see it, but you smell it everywhere. I'm going to light this fucking fire and I'm going to burn shit down. And then we're done with it, you know? <laughs> like, and although I have to say, it is extremely nerve wracking for me. And the sensations, I think we talked about this before, right? The somatic experiences I have in my body are tearing me apart every time because everything for my autistic self is so fucking panic and yet I'd rather do that and be done with it than to having to walk on eggshells because I don't know when I step into your climbing little coals and like be like trapped and oh god I could go on for hours about that mm. I love how you shared that I love and I think you're you're, you're spot on with your definition of curiosity look the thing that keeps us all asleep is the distraction the opiate of the masses the alcohol drama um sport i love i love brazilian i love brazilian jiu-jitsu I, I i make no excuses about that and yet sport can be such a distraction it can be such a a joyous thing as part of our development and journey um soap operas there are some the list of things that can that act as distractions from the reality of your of existence that keep you trapped in the experience of the physical only and not asking the why question the deeper curiosity question that you've just described there monique that to me is um there's nothing wrong then in not being caught up in drama and not being caught up in people's business for the sake of it. Like the, you know, the energy, the, the energy is shifting here, isn't it? If we talk about the frequency of curiosity, as you describe it, trying to understand the nature of this existence, the reason that we are living and breathing inside of this body right now, as opposed to curiosity as to why next door's neighbor had an affair with the milkman and then he's gone and done some, you know, like the, the dramatic element already just in those two areas, I can feel a shift in my, in energy. Right. So there's, mm. there's a change in the frequency here, that frequency of drama and, and emotion for emotion's sake and gossip and all of those things, really, that's the energy of the, um, keeping everybody asleep, keeping everybody satiated with the way things are not lighting them up with curiosity as opposed to what we're talking about as true curiosity this energy to walk down that path and to not stay stuck there's nothing wrong with where people are or where anybody finds themselves I, i'm a great believer that we are in exactly the right place at exactly the right time and everything is exactly as it's meant to be and that doesn't mean that we don't exert our will and set intentions and change our circumstance our life scenario our life scenery 
Of course we do. We always try to strive to be better, to put the cream on, to make our skin white, to go and sit in the sun, to get our skin brown, right? All of these things are all valid, all part of the human condition that we all feel and experience, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's that deeper curiosity, not the, not the thing that keeps you distracted from mm. waking up. I think that's the differentiation here, isn't it? What so if we look at the if we look at the whole concept, we're talking about living in duality in a non-dual world, right? How do you think can people wake up? And do you think the people who are already kind of I don't want to say ahead, but you know, like they're in a different face of consciousness. How how do you think? Or maybe there isn't, but or maybe we should. Is there a way to bring consciousness, more consciousness, to the people who aren't conscious? And should we bring more consciousness to those people? Great questions. Great questions, because we can only share our experience, right? And our experience in sharing that, in bringing love to other people, meeting them where they're at with zero judgment, without, we're not kind of going, I'm right, you're wrong, this is good, that's bad. There's none of that. There's just a meeting people with love and with compassion and understanding and sharing our experiences for me it was a a real shake up like colin everything that you know to be true in the world is about to collapse like a house of cards your house your car your business every, your bank account everything that you've got is going to go like you're going to lose all of it and so now there was like a sweeping of the decks And everything I seen in my physical completely changed. The car that I got into, the place of work that I drove to every day, it all shifted in my world. It was like it was a cataclysmic shift and change. And it was that that caused me to go seeking and looking. I was a worship leader in a Christian church for 10 years before that. Right. Mm. So it's not that I've been. I haven't been on a spiritual journey. If you'd have had this come, if you'd have tried to wake me up just before my business went bust, I'd have been like, what are you on about? I am awake. I am awake. I'm a Christian. I'm wide awake. I know all, I know all that there is. Right. And this kind of, <laughs> this war. And now you're working for the Satan. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm on the dark side. Right. So, but, but <laughs> there's, there's, there's this sense of like, we talk about universal truth. I believe that what we understand and know to be, divine, universal, the non-dual nature of existence. We are all one. We are all the same. And that doesn't matter the color of your skin, the shape or size of your body, the uh, faith or religion that you're born into, the life scenery that exists around you really matter not. What matters most is that we are all, we are all one and we all share this same air, this same planet. And, the, and we're connected in ways that We just don't see physically. We just don't see. And then, so it's not about changing other people. It's just about meeting with love and with compassion. Here's the thing. I used to think, right, prayer. So sitting in prayer, shut the door, shut the world out, the physical world out, and sit in prayer for five hours. What a waste of time. What a total waste mm. of time. I think well, that's a total waste of time, right? If we don't believe or we don't appreciate or don't understand that we're all connected energetically in the invisible planes and that the intentions that we send out energetically, invisibly, materialize then back into the realm of existence that is the physical, if we appreciate that, prayer now becomes one of the most powerful things that you can do. And Please don't take my label of prayer as a Christian interpretation because prayer is the intention that we set into the divine, into the universal, into the creator. However you frame it, whatever your frame of reference is, prayer is your intentional showing up in a way that betters your existence and the existence of those around you. 
that's universal. That doesn't have connotations of a church or of a religion or anything. And then when we see the world this way, how much more powerful it is. So now yeah. prayer takes on a whole other dimension, doesn't it? Or if we replace pr prayer with intention, sets on a whole yeah. different tone. So now yeah. is, is it worthless? If we can literally, if we can change the world with nothing more than a thought, an intentional thought, wow. Much more than any amount of money in anybody's bank account could ever do right now, right? That's mega. Everybody has that. Everybody has that power. And for me, the mm. awakening, the awakening of humanity is just shining a light on that for, and allowing people to see that for themselves. Mm. What do you think? I wonder, because most stories we hear about like wake, awakening, waking up, coming conscious kind of things they seem to be all like rock bottom stories wake up calls shake ups as you said mm -hmm. and i wonder if there needs to be <laughs> and this is a funny thing i wonder if that needs to be a dual experience an experience of duality you need to go through so much pain and suffering first until you cannot cope with it anymore and make the conscious decision to experience life differently. And that means you have to change how you experience life, right? Yeah, because and the so, change is forced, isn't it? The change is forced in that sense. Because otherwise we yeah. sit in our comfort, we sit in our comfort zone and yeah. don't allow the change because it feels too scary to us. Yeah, and so I wonder if if there are people out there who, and I'm sure there are, but it's probably a very tiny like number of people who uh, just wake up one day and be like, I'm blessed, I'm divine, I'm going to change my life, I'm going to wake up now. You know what I mean? It's like they read Eckhart Tolle and they be like, you know what? That sounds like a great idea to me. I have all the money. I have all the uh, houses and the Lambos, but I'm going to sell it all. I'm going to start uh, changing. Like, I don't, I feel like this is not how it works. And I think that's where duality comes in. I feel like duality is forcing us through these different life experiences in order for us to make, hopefully, better decisions sometimes they're not any better sometimes not better in like good or bad in in the judgmental way but we just go a different route that is ending up just another reroute to where we are supposed to go maybe and uh i think that's the most duality experience that we can have in a world of non-dual experience yep. like it's almost like the non-duality is the universe in itself and our experiences without the universe is what's the duality part of it if that makes sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's almost like it's almost like a ping pong or like a pendulum is almost better. You you go through the pendulum and only when you're like, it's never going to be still, right? The pendulum always goes like left, right, left, right, whatever. And so you're going through the duality in the pendulum. But when it goes to the mid part, that's the one second where you can feel the non-dual experience of the whole around you. But I still feel like that <laughs> without all of this pain and suffering, like for you, it was losing your business, all of the money, all of your your identity that was connected to, I'm going to be this multimillionaire and everything. For me, it was like, I was, look, I know that a lot of spiritual people say, and we can discuss this maybe another time, 
Oh, that's it. See, our topics always come up at the end they of any episode. They just come up, yeah. <laughs> so, um, most spiritual people believe that we choose, that our soul chooses to come into this lifetime in this specific experience. So apparently I chose, however that worked, I chose to be born with all of these life-threatening diseases and go through all of this like shebang and die twice and happy days. What a great choice. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what a life. So, um, it, you know, it my duality seems to be a lot darker than a lot of other people's duality, if that makes sense. So my pendulum swing, swings really high on the pain and the suffering part. And I sometimes feel like I don't get high enough on the joy part. It's almost like I can just just see over that oh there's there's happiness and then like boop oh wait a second you know lung explodes these and that whatever so um doesn't make any sense do i make makes, any point with that makes total sense and it it reminds me a lot of the the dow the way the the scent the pendulum is Lao Tzu talks about that sense of like finding balance and mm. i think what you describe is is the nature of existence we are non-dual we are non-dual living in a perceived duality and that's mm. the that's the ultimate reality of this we will finish our conversation now and you know i'll go and make lunch and then i'll eat it and then my body will process it and then it'll come out to me in the bathroom a few hours later you know that's the nature of this 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 existence we will move through the physical arena that we're in and yet, at the same time, we are all interconnected in the invisible. And the idea of the pendulum is the sense of like that feeling of of finding and appreciating that balance. When I was a kid, I used to love the swings on the play park, like you swing up and then you swing down. I used to think that if I swung hard enough, I could go all the way around. Right. So yeah. that's cool. and um, try that. <laughs> yeah, try that. But but with the swing, when you're swinging up, then it swings back down. And then at that moment, when you're neither swinging up, no swinging back you're in perfect harmony perfect balance but the moment you're there you're gone and you're swinging back up and then you come back down and then for a second less than a second you're there but it's elusive that to me that moment is the um the the thing that we're all striving to experience and feel more of and yet the reality is that we swing up and we swing down we swing up and we swing down. And that's another universal truth, the truth of rhythm, the nature of rhythm to all things. And I think there are all of these factors at play. And if only we can bring ourselves to become aware of them, then we can begin to see the nature of this. Oh, mm. this is a season of swinging up right now. This is happening to me. How cool. Whoosh. Oh, this is a season of swinging back right now. How cool that this is happening to me. And then it yeah. just becomes that natural rhythm of what we get to do every single day. Neither good nor bad, you know? That's a wrap. Beautiful. That's a wrap. <laughs> so I'm I'm really excited for our next conversation. I think we should definitely bring in what you just mentioned there, Monique. That Absolutely. Wonderful. Woohoo! Thank you so much. Well, that was great. See you next week, everyone. Yeah, see you next week. Uh, tune in for more of these fun, fun conversations. Thank you for joining us on the Paradox of Life. We are Monique and Colin, guiding you on the journey to discover your truth. If you enjoyed this podcast, please review, subscribe, and share it with someone who needs to hear it. Let's embrace this journey together, investigating norms, challenging our perceptions, and questioning everything. Remember, asking tough questions is how we find real answers. It's how we get to know ourselves and connect with others. Stay curious, keep questioning, and together let's uncover the truth that make life worth living.